today I'm speaking to somebody that comes very highly recommended by um, Reverend Dave. Uh, he's a very close friend and it's Pastor Andy Jackson from the Coach House Church in Stockport. Hi Andy. Hi there. Hi Barbara. Oh, thank you for coming. Nice to agreeing. be with you. Yes. Um, no problem. You can't turn Dave down. <laughs> no. He's like a force to be reckoned with. Um, Absolutely. Could you introduce yourself and tell everybody a bit about yourself so we can get to know you and your journey and how you came to faith? Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm very fortunate to be the pastor of the church that I got saved in. Um, so I, got, uh, I came to the Lord when I was 17, uh, which was way back in 1980. And so um, you can work out now my age. But um, I joined because actually a group of people when I was at secondary school um, were just, wow, how can I say this? I looked at them and I looked at them and thought, there's something different about them and I want to be part of their friendship group. I was jealous of them. I was jealous of the way that they were treating each other. And, you know, I, I, was, I was a little bit of a act first, ask afterwards kind of person, which got, myself, got me into a little bit of trouble because I was a bit boisterous. And, um, but I saw these guys and uh, they, were, they were really good together. Really, they seemed to really enjoy each other's company and I was very jealous of it I wanted to be part of their group and I remember looking at them thinking I really want to be part of them and I managed to kind of wheedle my way in really to this little group this friendship group and then they invited me down to a youth group and uh, so I came with them on a Friday night and that youth group was here at the, the, the church uh, and it was called the Coach House Church then back then so the, the church itself has come on a bit of a journey so we've just renamed ourselves the Coach House Church. Um, so we went through a period of time where we were known as Heaton Chapel Christian Church, which is where Dave came to know us as well when he walked through the door. Um, so this group met at church and they, they, all I remember is looking at the leaders uh, and thinking, these leaders, they bring us to church, they don't ask us to do anything, they put on all of this work, they never charge us, nothing's too much for them. They just love us. And for the first time, I realized what love looked like in terms of I was just being given something for my benefit out of their goodness. And it made a, it made a huge impression. And uh, one of the people that comes into my life and also comes into Dave's life, Reverend Dave's life, is, is a guy called Derek, Derek Sykes. He's actually the father of my wife. That's another story, and that, 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 but that, that's part. She was his daughter, Melanie, who's now my wife, was part of that group that I wanted to be in. And so we came to church, and all we were asked to do really, they would put on pool, snooker, everything, and they just asked us to spend five minutes listening to something about God, the God slot, if you like. And uh, we put up with that simply because we knew we were being given the benefit of all this other stuff. And we didn't take much notice of it, to be honest. It was, we tolerated it. And the, but over time, I realised that some of this group, the reason they were acting like they were acting and the reason the leaders were acting in the way they were is because they had a relationship that was secure for them. They had a solid security in what they believed. And it meant something to them and it was real. And it was that that made them act in the way they did. So my story really is one of just slowly coming into the church and then one day being sat in the service. I remember coming to the service on a Sunday night and a missionary was speaking. And uh, this missionary was basically talking about, it was before the Iron Curtain came down, so they were basically talking about how people in, in, in countries behind the Iron Curtain weren't allowed to be Christians. And so to gather together, they would take whatever they had from the Bible, which in some cases was just a ripped out page, and they would meet in secret in caves. And so this missionary was telling us the story of these, these guys and their bravery and, and what the Bible meant to them. Um, and I remember standing there thinking, well, if these guys would risk their life for a page of the Bible, I've got about four or five Bibles at home that I've never opened. So I've given one at school, given one by my godparents and you know you have bibles that are just accumulate in the home never been opened ever 
and it just suddenly struck me that Sunday that actually if these people were prepared to die for it, then there must be something very, very real in it. And so I went home and started reading it. And so, yeah, Genesis was great. Exodus was great. <laughs> Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers, not so great. <laughs> Um, and so you kind of stop and then I, I, a friend of mine said, no, no, you need to read the New Testament. You need to read about Jesus and you need to read, start there and then the rest of it will make sense. So then I started to read the New Testament and within minutes of reading about Jesus, I knew he was real. I, I just knew it. I, I, not a head thing, a heart thing. And I absolutely understood why people would give their life for that relationship. And so that was the start of my journey, and that was when I was 17, and I've stayed with this church. I've never been anywhere else other than this church, all the way through my, my teens and my, into my adulthood, into my married life with the kids. Uh, the kids are now gone off to universities and all kinds of things. And uh, in the last year and a half or a year and a half ago, I had the just absolute privilege of applying for a pastorship here and, and, and getting it. And uh, to be honest, it's, it's almost a completeness. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of a promise that God gave me to when I was 19, when I was going to leave the church. And God interrupted me in a service and said, you know, not a physical voice, but I knew it was God saying, no, you need to stay here. And I've got to work for you. And that was when I was 19. So through all the thick and thin, I have known that if God can tell me to stay, he can also tell me to leave if it was right for me to leave. So I've never felt the compulsion to actually abandon the place, even though things have been difficult because things are, things do go up and down. We don't have easy rides all the time. In churches, we a group, a collection of people that, you know, like families, we can fall out. So it, it, it can be quite difficult, but you, you learn to, when, when God's in, in the story and he's in your life, then you learn to hear what he's saying to you. And... Here is the result, and now I'm, I mean, if I showed you the church, I mean, it's completely knocked about in these last 12 weeks because we've just totally taken the time to rip it apart and rebuild it. So we're hopefully getting ready for people coming back in in a couple of weeks' time, which is exciting. I notice that you're getting ready to come back in as well, which is good. Yes, we're all very excited. How have you found lockdown? Um, actually... Not as bad as I thought it would be. I think when we realised that I'd have to close church, we were a little bit, it was, it was a bit of 50-50. Some people were saying, as, as people would do, um, that's showing a lack of faith, closing the doors. Um, I didn't think that at all. I, I, my view was we need to keep people safe. And keeping people safe means that we have to find other ways of doing church. Then we should do that. I actually think that we've learned to become proper church. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it, it, it's a little bit like doing church on Zoom. You're looking at a screen. You're looking at screens at you know 35, 40 screens or something, but you're actually looking and engaging with individuals on the screens, which you wouldn't actually do if you were ministering and they were all <coughs> all sat in the building. You wouldn't actually be looking at the faces. So some of that interaction has actually been brought closeness, a oneness. We've managed to do um, house home groups uh, on Zoom as well and things like that, communication tools. So we've actually really valued the fact that we enjoy fellowship. And I think what it's done is it's shown us how much we valued it before, but we took it for granted. And so what's happened now is that we, we value that friendship and now we've we're not taking it for granted. We realise what a beautiful thing fellowship is. And so, yes, we're really looking forward to coming out of it, but I think we've learned a lot of lessons in it as well. Uh, and also just seeing neighbourhoods just start. To, it's, I, it's almost like God's reset the country or reset the world. It's almost like God said, you know, enough's enough. I'm going to give you a chance to reset. And more importantly, church, I'm going to let you see that maybe the way you've been doing church has not been the best way. And maybe there are other ways. So it's about what we take out of what we've learned and put into the church as we go forward. But the relationships, I think, have grown stronger because it's made people look out for one another. It's made people value 
the relationships. It's made people value fellowship and meeting together. And I think coming out of it, I think we'll be stronger for it. So it's been a bit peculiar because it has been, We, I think everyone hits a wall at some point during the lockdown as well. Everyone hits this wall and go, right, enough's enough now. I've been doing this for a few weeks and now I'm frustrated with it. And I think everyone gets that. Um, I think we hit our wall about eight or nine weeks in and we just thought, no, I'll finish now. I can't, we want to do something else. I want to get back together. Um, and of course, we're still in that position now, but we're now looking at getting coming out of that and progressing out of it. We had a leaders meeting on Tuesday to kind of just put a roadmap of what, you know, what we try and do. Uh, whether it was our a lot of our congregation is in the uh, at risk category, so we just had to be very careful. Much as we want to get back, there are two things which are restraining me. One is one of which is I don't. We need to prioritize those that can't come for whatever reason. So we need to make sure that they are not ignored and not left out. So they become the priority. But the second thing is making sure that when we do come back, that we don't come back just as it was before. Mm. That we take this opportunity to say, look, if if we've reset things and if fellowship is now valuable to us and we want to be real church, how do we learn to do that as we go forward? We don't want to just go, well, that was very nice. That was the 12 weeks, 13 weeks lockdown. That was how we did church then. Let's just go back to how we were before. Because I think we've learned so much in that 13 weeks. We need to pull that forward. So we've rewired the church totally so that we can live broadcast all the meetings to Zoom for people who can't get to church for whatever reason. So when we get back, we will continue doing some of the things that we've done in the lockdown period. Oh, brilliant. They'll be very glad for that. I'm sure. I hope so. I, it feels the right thing to do. I think one of the things that we did straight, right off the bat was to... We felt that as a speaking team, so there's lots of things been de- there's lots of things been developed in the in the lockdown period that I was hoping for, but have, they've they've happened in the lockdown period because they've had to yeah. out of necessity. So a speaking team's been developed, and uh, one of the things that we wanted to do right from this right from the off was to record uh, what we call a beacon, which is our long, uh, daily devotion, and we put that on the website, we put that on Facebook, and what have you, and. It's just one of the speaking team giving a 10-minute thought, but it's, it's then broadcast. Those that haven't got internet, we've re- we bought some uh, little sound, re- sound recorders that are washable and waterproof. We just record it onto a, a little SD card, stick it in, and it's, a, it's got a built-in speaker. They just press play, and all of the beacons and the messages are there for the, for the week, and we just take that back and update it. So we've got four of those in the round, including other churches, that uh, haven't got anywhere for all that we've been helping support. And so we're going to carry on that as well. We're going to carry on trying to do a daily devotion that we reach out to people. Those that haven't got that, we print it out as well every Saturday and just hand deliver it to those that have, you know, stuck. So we've kind of used it as a keeping in contact tool, but also, hey, we're still here. We want to encourage you and we want you to, to move on in the Lord at the same time. No, well, I think I think one of the things it's done is it's made churches look at the way they're doing things, and I think we we can survive in a bubble sometimes where we think you know what this this has always been the way, therefore this is the way, and it takes something like this to make you question sometimes the way we've done stuff, and is it the best way? Is there a reason why we're not encountering you know some 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 groups of people that, that perhaps are just completely left outside? of church because church has set itself up only to cater in this very narrow way and we not by not but you know we haven't meant to do it but i think we we sometimes don't realize what we've done until something like this happens and you go actually maybe we've not done this right maybe there are other ways of doing this that are more effective and a better way of communicating the gospel to a wider more diverse group of people Show us your Bible and talk us through um, how you read it and study it and your daily spiritual practice. Oh. <laughs> Hang on a second. Here's my Bible. There's my Bible. What, what do you want to see on it? There. Oh, so it, it's a study Bible, is it? It's a study Bible. It's um, a life application study Bible. Mm-hmm. Um, I tend to use the NLT, the New Living Translation. Um, 
not for any other reason other than I find it easy to uh, read and take in. Um, but I, obviously, I will study with lots of different versions, especially if I'm, especially if I'm teaching, um, because uh, some, some, whilst it's a, whilst it's good to read it and it, and it gets most things right, I think uh, some some of the translations sometimes is a little bit loose, and so you need to take a, into account some other things. So uh, I will read for my own private devotion. Um, I will pray. I will read in conjunction with normally uh, either a, a, through a church or, or some some um, some study guide that we might just look at. Say, we're looking at Ephesians or whatever, just look at something. But I, I tend to suggest to my re speaking team that we use a book like this. I don't know if you can see that. It's called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Right. And basically, what that does is it kind of breaks down how you read the Bible. So kind of ask yourself questions like whenever you read, ask yourself, what did that mean at the time it was written? How do I see God and God's character in what I'm reading? And then to then form an exercise which says, what can I learn from that today? What can I take out of that? Because some of it is firmly in the day that it was written. And some of it is revealing to us the character of God, which not, doesn't change. So we can get something from that, but doesn't necessarily. So some things that people just go, oh, it says that then, so it must mean that now. And you go, well, actually, <laughs> if you read around the, where it's written and the book, why it's written, you'll find that actually that was just dealing with a cultural point of the day. And we've got our own cultural points of the day that we need to address and understand God in. So you have to know God's character, which doesn't change which is what we can read and find. So principally that book says, look, this is what you, this is how you read it. How did it apply then? How does it apply if it does apply now? And what do we see about the character of God, which is the underlying statement, what's the big picture that's been laid out before us? And what can we take now? And what can't we take? And the thing that it teaches you more or less is that the Bible can never say something it was never meant to say. So it stops us kind of saying, actually, I'm going to think this now because I want to think this when the Bible's quite specifically saying you can't think like that because this is who I am and you can't change that. Yeah, that's good. Does that make sense? Is that... It does, yeah. I think um, because sometimes we can look at the Bible. We, I, I, we may have lost connection. Are you still there? I'm did that make sense, there. Barbara? Yes, it did, yeah. yeah. Sorry, you froze up for a second now. I wasn't sure. Oh, whether well, I froze all, all up at your end either. <laughs> okay. No, um, we, we sometimes forget that the Bible is a book about God, don't we? Because we try Correct. and put ourselves in there. And what's this for me? What what can I get from this? And what's it speaking to me? We forget that it's first and foremost yep. about God. I, I think what we do is we tend to read it in light of where we are mm -hmm. and what we want it to say. Um, and sometimes that's right. But but often we'll read. Oh, sorry, someone's at the door. Bear with me a second. Hello. Hello. Get all the excitement today. A parcel from Amazon. Okay, hang on a second. Sorry, but can you bear with me, sir? Of course, not a problem. Um. Sorry, where were we? We, I was going to ask you about um, a Bible verse or passage that really has spoken to you or is speaking to you. What's um, something you really stand on? Wow. Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you my favourite Bible passage. That's probably easiest. Although, <laughs> it changes from day to day. But my, there's one that always stays with me. And that's Romans 5 verse 8 um, but the, the whole context of it so Romans 5 verse 8 says but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us whilst we were still sinners and there's a whole premise around that particular thing but I just I just love the fact that actually God doesn't wait for us to get well before he steps in he doesn't wait for us to kind of and, and I think sometimes there's this great big we have a misunderstanding that somehow we have to get ourselves to a point that God will accept us. 
Whereas this, what this passage is saying is that you know, he showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die whilst we were still sinners. He didn't wait for us to get to this mysterious place of acceptance. And that means, by the, by the token of that, that means that anybody and everybody, regardless of where they are right now, Jesus can accept them and bring them to a place of safety. And uh, so the, let, me, let me just read from verse 6, because uh, you know, to, to show the context of the whole thing, it says that when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. I mean, that, that in itself is just a, a lovely line. Now, perhaps, and then it goes on to say that people would, you know, would not be willing to die for an upright person, or someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die whilst we're still sinners. In other words, everybody has access. I, and, I, and I love that total kind of, wide open arms view that that actually whilst we might think think that we are unca or incapable of of, of of god getting to us because of what we're doing or how far away from him we are or whether we have no understanding of him whatsoever nowhere is far enough for him not to get to us yeah. and and no circumstance and no no difficulty that we're in, no sin that we find ourselves in, is actually so far away and so difficult that Christ can't reach us. And I just love that because I think a lot of the time Christianity is forced upon us, and the onus is is that actually you have to do it. You have to do something. You have to you have to bring yourself to a point where before God can can reach you. And what the Bible tells me all the time is that He He understands us. He knows exactly where we're at. And he's always there for us. All we need to do is stop and ask him, ask him for help. And, you know, when we were utterly helpless, in other words, when there was nothing else we could turn to, we tried everything. And, and it's sometimes in life we go and we try absolutely everything before we realise that God is the answer. And God knew that that time would come and he provided Jesus just for that. So his sacrifice is sufficient for everything. So that's my that's my kind of favourite kind of go to verse, and it often crops up in a lot of my sermons and things. And uh, yeah, because it, I think for me, it's just something that comforts me and gives me that. It, it shows me who God is, yeah. shows me His heart, and it helps me to understand His heart. And uh, it also helps me to understand me that you know I, I can never be in a position either where. I kind of worked my way into God's good books because that doesn't happen. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's that one. Is that? It's very um, prodigal son language as well, isn't it? Like whilst he was still far off, the father yeah. saw him. And I, and I think it's it's a theme that's throughout Scripture. I don't think it's it's in the Old Testament. It's all the way through. Is that characterization that actually God cares and and loves and you know, you, you can't run away from him. You, there's no way you can run. No. There's no way you can hide. It says, and that's the Old Testament language now. There's no way you can hide. There's no way you can run where God can't find you and God can't get to you and God can't reach out to you. And and that should be a great hope for us that uh, that actually he's always going to be there. And we, I think sometimes we do convince ourselves that our circumstances are such that God's, abandoned us that he can't see us uh, and that's never the case and you know i think that's a it's a good thing to be able to talk to people who are in struggling situations as well whatever that might be whether it's an addiction or you know lots of different things you know nothing is far away so far away that god can't help and i and i just love that bit yeah, thank god and so how how do you pray then how do you draw closer to god whoa how do you draw closer to god how do I pray? Uh, I find myself, <laughs> this is going to sound really stupid, but one of the times that I find that I feel most kind of energised is in the bath. I've never <laughs> had that one before. <laughs> in the bath. And so I will have a bath every day. Mm -hmm. And I, I love nothing more than kind of washing the dirt the day off and then just, 
contemplating. And I think for me, it's that's a point, that's a place where I've just got quietness and I've just got solitude and alone time. Uh, and it's kind of withdrawn from the busyness of the day. And so, that, um, so really, that I mean, that would be the whatever that whatever that circumstance would be for anybody, where where's your quiet time, where you're away from the busyness of everything else that's intruding on your life on a day by day basis. Any time, any point in time where that can happen is the time where you're most likely to hear God's voice when He's speaking to you, because you're not battling all the other voices that are going on. Uh, and so, for me, that tends to be when I'm in the bath. So if I'm stuck, if I'm stuck with a servant or I'm stuck with a, a problem or I've got something that I'm just mulling over and I can't find a little bit of peace on it, I'm going to have a bath and I'll, and I'll just soak in the water, but I'll also soak in the spiritually, if that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I'll just let God speak to me rather than me try and tell him what's going on because he knows anyway. I'll just let him speak his peace to me, which is Philippians 4, if you want another go-to passage. <laughs> so it's Philippians 4, it talks about, you know, uh, don't worry about anything. And I think this has been quite uh, apparent in the, in the lockdown situations with people. So Philippians 4, verse 6, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. And I think that that's, for me, is a bit of a key. We often don't thank God. And he's done a lot for us every single day and more than we realize. And I think sometimes we just need to stop and go, yes, I know I've got lots of issues, but God's been very faithful to me today. And he's done so much for me. And I not once turned to him and said, thank you. So let's start there and say thank you. And so I'm, and Philip just was, don't worry about anything. He said, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. And then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. And his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And then it talks about fixing your thoughts on what is true and honourable. And I think, you know, that's how I hear God. That's how I take time to listen to God. It's about fixing my thoughts and my attention solely on him. And sometimes that's in the bath. Sometimes that's driving the car. Sometimes that's sat quietly in solitude. But very rarely is it when I'm busy, when I'm busy doing something, because I'm too busy to kind of focus and listen yeah. to what God's trying to say to me. So I think you do have to find a place where you can retract. And Jesus Himself retracted from the business of the day. He withdrew from His disciples. He withdrew from the crowd, and he and he found a place where he could speak to His Father and hear His Father's voice. And more importantly, he then did nothing that the father had not told him to do. So he must have been hearing those instructions and getting those instructions and finding the place where his father could speak to him. And it's the same for us, I think. It's about withdrawing from the business and finding a place of solitude. And a place where you can just... Uh, solitude is not just a place of solitude from people, but a solitude from the events and pressures that we have on a daily basis some point where we can just sit down, push that aside for a bit, as hard as that might be, and let God who loves us speak into that situation. And all of a sudden, this peace that passes all understanding absolutely does take effect. And I'm not sure that answers your question, but it's, it, it's yeah. for me, I think that's very, it, it's a central part. Well, I think life can be so busy, we forget to do that, don't we? We forget to just in God's presence yes and listen we like to do a lot of talking don't we but we don't like to listen is that, are you telling me off for talking too much no not <laughs> at all not at all so people use people use the news so don't worry about it it's fine I, I'm intrigued though actually when you and Dave are together because you oh, both, both... So I'll tell you what you, 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 ask Alison <laughs> ask Alison or ask Melanie they, they don't get a word in <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the, one of one of the beautiful things about one of the beautiful things about my relationship with 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 Reverend Dave is I call him Reverend Dave because you do, but uh, to me he's Dave. Um, one of the beautiful things is that we we because of the ministries he's been involved in and where I've been, 
we, we've not been together for very much of our for very much of our lives. So when Dave first came into the church, and I remember him coming in with his cropped hair and his bother boots on and his rolled up jeans, proper punk. <laughs> and I remember him coming into church, and uh, he lived not far from uh, from 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 Mel where where she lived, and he he got attracted, and he just he was on a spiritual journey, and he decided that he needed to understand who Jesus was and somebody gave him a tract from our church when he was just down in Stockport and he, and he followed it up. Now, I don't know how many people would actually follow it up, but he was on a spiritual journey and it just happened to come into his hand at the time he needed it when he was utterly helpless. Oof, God held his hand out. and But he acted on it. And so Derek, Derek who's Melanie's uh, father will tell you that he remembers Dave knocking on the door just going round to to their house and knocking on the door saying I want, I want to come to church I've been given this tract how do I come to church oh, brilliant. Uh, and so Derek arranged to bring him to church basically and the rest is history because he was on that journey he just found the truth very quickly yeah. uh, and then his other bits of his testimony obviously from around here things that happened to him in, in a spiritual sense that kind of woke him up to all these different things that were going on on the spiritual level uh and he found jesus and uh what a lovely guy to, you know because he just walks and all it's just i am who i am and i'm not gonna <laughs> i'm not gonna cover anything up and that's how he came to the lord and it was just so refreshing yeah. uh, and i think i was one of the first people that spoke to him when he when he came and and we've been quite close ever since then, so uh, which has been lovely. But then he went to college. You went to you felt he wanted to go to the to the ministry. You felt called to the Church of England, so he went to Bible college. Then he changed Bible college. Uh, we went to see him down on the south coast. That they were struggling as a as a, a married couple. They were really you know struggling with resources and money and all. I remember taking him a food hamper down to the south coast. Um, and one thing I know about Dave is that whenever, whenever it doesn't matter how long we've been apart, whenever we walk into a room together or see each other, it's there's a, it's instant. It, there's there's an instant friend, the instant love, instant regard for one another, and an instant interest in what's God doing in your life. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's why you can't shut us up. <laughs> just, because. Yeah, because we'll because we'll just sit there and we'll just talk, and it's about God we're talking about. Yeah, you know, we're talking about our circumstances, but what we're talking about is what God, how we discovered God in it, and how God's been using us in it, how God's been showing us the way in things, how God's been speaking through us in in the situations, and it, and it, sometimes it's to the kind of disrespect of our wives who sit there and just have to listen to us, but generally all four of us can have that connection, and it's. I'm very thankful that Dave is actually part of my accountability structure. So as a pastor in an independent church, I think it's really important that you have people that you can go and talk to who understand the kind of the pressures of, of leading a church and, and they're able to just, if I were to Dave, I'd know that he'd just tell me the truth. Yeah. If I was being an idiot, he would tell me you're being an idiot. Do, do, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, but but I would take it because I know it's true, yeah. and it, that, that's the level of our relationship, which I I value very much. Yeah. Even if we don't see each other on a very, you know, day to day basis, it's, there's an instant rapport whenever we do meet. But it's always based on what God's doing, which is great. You can't deny you're both passionate about God. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> well, that's good then. Yeah. Uh, last question. Yep. Could you tell us about a book that's been really influential in your um, spiritual walk? Okay. Well, apart from the Bible. Mm, yeah, yeah. You can't, you uh, can't no, pick the Bi Bible for Bible's, Bible's not allowed at this point. No. <laughs> okay. Um, wow. I think, I, think, I think books are very of the moment. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you're reading a book and it's like, this is speaking to me because it needs to speak to me. I'm getting something out of it because that's where I am on my journey and that's what I need right now. Um, that's my phone. 
Um, you can edit this, can't you? No, I, I just no. put it out like you just it put is. it out there, right? Excited. It's natural. It's how it is. But okay. nobody think, knows who was at the door before. No, that's fine. Um, I think a book that kind of is never far, never far is this one, yeah, Mere Christianity. Yeah. yeah. C.S. Lewis. Um, it's probably never far away, simply because you can just dip into it and it just speaks so much truth about. Uh, so if you don't know anything about the book, I mean you're nodding, so it looks like you do. But if people out there don't know about the book, generally this is. Uh, C.S. Lewis, Lewis wrote a series of lectures after the war um, and he takes, he talks about how his experiences of, of war and everything else that are going on just confirmed to him that Jesus was real and that God was real and it talks about the various, it's a, it's a series of lectures that basically steps you through and by the time you got to the end of it it's like this is undeniable, you know, you would be a fool to deny this. So, it, so that's why that's quite an important book, really, because it's a series of lectures, but they, they somehow they're very relevant today. So it's an oldish book, but it's a very relevant book to today. So I would highly recommend this one, Make Christianity. Eh? Pardon? Absolutely adore C.S. Lewis. A lovely yeah, book. Yeah, fantastic. And he's got a lovely way of writing as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm considering um, from the point of an atheist. I don't know about other, other books. No, that that's great. Yes, yeah, I, yeah. It's, it was one of my. Uh, I remember being at school. I mean, I before I became Christian, I, 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 I didn't really have an understanding of God. My parents had sent me to Sunday school because that's what people did in the day. Um, they didn't send you to Sunday school. I don't. I don't come from a Christian family at all. So, but we went to Sunday school because A, it gave my mum and dad a lie in, and, and B, we were going to be taught some good ethical behaviour. But I think, and you know, that, and, and I think that's true. And I think in society at the time, the, the behaviour, the, the good ethical behaviour was very key in society. I don't think it is so much nowadays. We, we're in a very different kind of society today where it's about breaking rules and changing rules if we can. And uh, so I'm very thankful, really, that I was brought up in a, a time when kind of we want you to teach, we want you to learn good ethics and good manners. Mm. So I had an understanding of this guy, God, but I had no connection at all. Just you hear about it from time to time. And then at secondary school, I remember just being taught that we were a miracle of chance, that we evolved from all these different things. And, and one of the teachers was basically telling us that we were monkeys. And I just had this objection. I don't know what it was, something raised inside of me. And I so I, I kind of stopped the teacher and I was just in the middle of the class because that's how I was. And I just said, Look, can I ask you a question? So I said, yeah. So I said, well, you're telling us, and this might be controversial, because I'm not, so I'm not trying to kind of jump in all over people's beliefs in, in, in creation and things. But at the time, this is something for me I was struggling with as a, as, a, as a teenager. And I just said to the teacher, I said, you teach, you're teaching us about survival of the fittest. I understand that. I kind of get that. But I have a question. So I said, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So I said, well, if it's survival of the fittest, how come some of the things that are fit are surviving? I said, sorry? I said, well, if we, we come from monkeys and that's because we've progressed because we are the fittest, then how come I go to the zoo and still see monkeys? How do they still... Why are they still there? Now, bearing in mind, this is just my objection, because this is how God was reaching me, not... You know, so it's, this is personal to me. And so I suddenly, re and she said to me, well, you're just going to believe it. So I said, well, what's the alternative to believing that? Because I can't get my head around it. I can't bring myself to kind of get, grasp that in the, in, the, in the sense that you're teaching it is. What's the alternative? So well, the alternative is you just have to have faith in something else. So I said, hang on a second, so you're telling me this is a faith thing. So just understanding it is a faith thing. 
or yes. Well, I find it easier that there's something or somebody that just went, I'm going to make that. And that's how we are. And that's how we were made. And so, well, you just have to believe that. No, it's just a matter of faith. I said, but you telling me to believe the other thing is also a matter of faith. So my understanding at that point was actually life needs faith. There is something inherent in us that cries out to understand where we're from and what where we're going and what is in other words there is more to life than just this and i remember thinking that as a, as a teenager i had no real concept of god at that time looking back now i can understand that that was part of god's calling of me and bringing himself to my attention um but yeah I just and and so really understanding who i've been un, then coming to church and seeing how god was working in people's lives was the clincher because it just made sense it all made sense of everything that i'd questioned so great that's great thank you so much for talking to us today and it's been great to thank you. you and to um, learn a bit more about you and your life and your work and your friendship with reverend <laughs> um, would you um pray for us please of course I will. Um, absolutely yeah. yeah father thank you for this time that we're able to spend together Lord, thank you for everything you've done in our lives. You, you sent Jesus to pay a penalty we couldn't pay. You sent Jesus to show a life that we couldn't live. You sent Jesus just to point the way and to bring us to you. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love that is just poured out upon us. We're undeserving and yet you still reach out to us. At the point of our lowest ebb, you still are there. When we try and run from you, you're still there. So, Father, thank you that you reveal yourself to us every day. You reveal yourself to, to us through your word, through conversations, through just the way you are. And, Father, we pray that uh, people will be encouraged to know you more. And once we do know you, to want to know you deeper, in a, in a deeper way, in a way which affects our lives on a daily basis and shows others of our relationship with you. Father, thank you for this opportunity. We pray, Lord, your blessing upon all those that might hear this or listen to this. And I thank you for the work that David and Alison and Barbara are doing over in St. Thomas's. And uh, Father, I just pray your blessing upon that church in Blackpool and our lives as we uh, continue our journey as you've called us to, to bless your name and for your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Pleasure, anytime, and I look forward to meeting you in the flesh. Oh yes, absolutely. At some, at some